What is up, everybody? Special edition of the Coast to Coast podcast tonight here on InsideCarolina.com. I'm your host, Joey Powell. Shrell McMillan is here all the way from steamy Augusta, where he has been judging a uh, grandmamas who look like Danny Glover in the face contest. Um, Sean Moran is joining us live from the West Coast, where he just sprinted home on the 405 to, to join us to talk about James Aconquo joining UNC. So first things first, you guys know how we do this. We're brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. I'm going to do what I can to, to give you guys the vitals and get out of the way and let Sherelle and Sean bring you the knowledge that you guys want to hear about. Uh, Aconquo, 6'8", 240, from West Virginia by way of Maidenhead, England. Uh, Sean, Sherelle, either one of you guys ever been to Maidenhead? No, it's uh, – so if I remember correctly, it's actually really close to Windsor Castle. Um, it's It shares a stop with Windsor, I think. Uh, but anyway – uh, that's where he's from by way of a uh, prep school in the U.S., and that's your geography lesson for the night. First things first, Sean, this feels like the perfect complement for uh, for for this roster for UNC. Am I wrong? Am, am I being overzealous here, or do you feel like this is a really, really nice piece late in the game? Unmute yourself. It, it would help if I – There you go. Start. Yeah, there we go. So not a, not a great start, but uh, no, I, I – I agree with you, and especially diving into and and watching watching him uh, last year at West Virginia. I think it is a really good fit and good piece. Uh, I think with the proper expectations. But I, last last time with John, we were talking about what's the missing piece or what's ideal. We talked about an athletic wing, but at the same time, knowing who they do have, really, if they they had that almost third third big man that can complement Armando Jalen Washington. Uh, you know, we'll see how Zayden High fits in, but having that true big uh, that isn't expecting to come in and and be the man. So I think from what he did in minimal time last year, uh, the most likely role he will play this year, as well as what his his strengths are. I think it it's a great fit for early July and and what you're going to get in the portal at this time. Sherell, I think a lot of folks will look at us and say, "Well, you guys said the portal was closed." Well, there's a caveat here in that West Virginia's coach, Bob Huggins, uh, was relieved of his duties or you know, resigned, however you want to look at it. He is no longer the coach of West Virginia, which opened up the portal door for some players that were still in the roster. Sherell, I want you to kind of give us the synopsis of how this whole thing went down with UNC getting in touch with Oconquo, who is now, if I'm correct, he's practicing for uh, U-20s in England back home. Uh, it's just such a weird development of how this whole thing kind of got microwaved and now it turned out with him committing to UNC today. Tell us a little bit about the process. Yeah. So uh, it started, I guess, you know, with the Bob Huggins situation and him uh, also not being the head coach anymore. And so there's a a loophole. I don't think anybody knew about that says if a coach is fired or, or let go at this point, then players have, I believe it was 30 days to enter the portal which at the point that we recorded a couple of weeks ago and talked about this, um, neither of the bigs that UNC ultimately contacted from West Virginia had entered the portal. Uh, so uh, James Wagu, I think is how you pronounce it, was one the first one to enter the portal. He since committed to Alabama. And then Okwankwo entered, I think, a couple of days later. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it seemed like from the start, there's certain earmarks to a UNC portal recruitment. And I think this one for us, uh, you know, behind the scenes started to ring some of those bells. It is a pretty high academic kid, uh, you know, from overseas who's been in college for a couple of years. And we can get into his story uh, soon. But his recruitment was very quiet. There was an initial phone call from UNC. There were no interviews given. And it just it just kind of had the feel of something where UNC was working behind the scenes and felt like they had a chance to close it. Um, We know that before. UNC had talked to, you know, I would, I would say a bevy of players that didn't just work out for, for whatever reason um, post uh, Wiltshire decommitment and, you know, kind of in the middle of June and, and moving on. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, this one just had a good feel for UNC. Uh, it was a position of need, a uh, position they tried to get. Uh, you know, the, the transcript looked good, you know, no character concerns. And it just it kind of fell in their lap because I don't know. If, you know, Bob Huggins' situation doesn't happen, if there's another player available, um, 
you know, that, that fits that description because they had been looking and then just had struck out. So it was fortuitous timing and UNC capitalized on it. It was a two week recruitment. Hasn't visited campus. Uh, this, they'll be similar to Brady Manick in that he committed to UNC without ever being on the campus. But we believe he's still going to take his official visit um, at the end of the month. And that'll be his chance to kind of see campus and, and be ready to roll in the fall. Sherelle, we're not going to talk a ton about recruiting in general tonight. We'll save that for our show on Sunday uh, as regularly scheduled. But I think we're seeing, once again, Hubert Davis has some acumen in recruiting regardless of the circumstance. Can you speak to how this is just another example of that and how, you know, again, a truncated window of two weeks, a kid that had never set foot in Chapel Hill, a kid that's only been playing basketball for a short window of time. We'll talk about that uh, again in a little bit. What's the... What's what's next for Hubert to prove here as far as being able to convince a kid to play his college basketball Chapel Hill? Well, we've said before, you know, roster management is a 365 a year, you know, 24 hour a day job. And I think how Hubert Davis has signed different players throughout, you know, his uh, I guess entering his third season at UNC, he's kind of done everything. He's got, you know, the highly coveted transfer. He's got kind of the secret under the radar <laughs> transfer. He's got the top five guard. He's got you know, the, the, I guess he doesn't have that top 15, you know, big out of high school, but it's really the only thing kind of lacking from his resume. He's got the late riser. He's got the early riser. Um, so he's done a little bit of everything on the trail, um, beating, you know, some of the major schools that Carolina had trouble beating the last few years for players. Um, so it just shows that they're willing to do kind of whatever it takes to keep uh, making the roster uh, talented, to add depth where it's needed. Um, and they'll do it up until, I mean, today's July 6th. So this is basically the same day that Dawson Garcia committed a couple of years ago. So we see that they're willing to take stuff into July to keep improving the roster. And, and they did it again this time. And we again, we will talk about this a little bit on our show, our regularly scheduled show on Sunday evening, uh, just about assessing the roster because Sherell and Sean and I have talked about, you know, middle of June, Father's Day time, we would get to that. Uh, so we're going to definitely dive into that a little bit uh, this coming weekend. Sean, when, when you watch his film and when you see him on tape, you know, this is a guy who played roughly 10 minutes a game um, for, for West Virginia last year. Like his his blocks or his average blocks per possession is really high. Uh, his expected points per possession is really high. I know that's a stat you're fond of. But he looks like an above-the-rim player, even for a guy that's that's listed at 6'8". Is it just his timing? Is it the fact that he's got a real good nose for the ball? Is it athleticism and, and springiness off the floor? What is it that makes him play seemingly bigger than than his listing? Well, I love I love you using advanced stats. That's uh, music <laughs> music to my ears. I'm trying um, to help out my I'm trying to help out the guys that everybody wants to hear. Man, I'm, my job is to tee you guys up. I think when when watching him, I, I was looking at him almost as a six you know six ten guy and and even when you said six eight I, I had to go back and look because he definitely plays plays bigger um you can see him on the defensive end where you know people would go at him in the post at times and they go straight up and he just wait 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 and and then he's gonna go face on and and block your shot if you try to go straight up with him uh you know it was a reported this is coming from a lot of the high school articles but he has a seven two wingspan so you know putting him not in Jalen Washington territory, but, but pretty close. So I think that definitely helps on the, the block shots. Um, from an athleticism perspective, he's not, I'd say, super springy, but he's definitely springy enough where he can get off the floor. Really, his main strength is he crashes the boards extremely hard. Uh, you know, looking at his Ken Palm numbers, he didn't play enough minutes to qualify for a lot of the leader roles. But just from a percentage basis, he would have been top five offensive rebounder, uh, top six in, in block percentage in the conference. But he crashes hard, and you know there's a few possessions which we'll we'll show in the the video scouting scouting report. But right off a free throw, he'll go up and and he'll grab it, um, and and he'll look to kick out. Uh, sometimes he'll look to attack if it's open. But yeah, he's you know he's a, a beast on the boards, and he's springy enough uh, with a good wingspan and. Once again, not not a uber athlete, but he's a guy that if, if he switches, you know, he can move his feet. He's 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 versatile, and I think that's why you mentioned the ten minutes per game and in Big Twelve play, he was getting just under twelve minutes. So, you know, to put that in perspective, that was more minutes than Demarco Dunn was averaging mm -hmm. for UNC. So, uh, it wasn't like he was only playing in once every every few games. Uh, but I think he's a he's strong. 
and he's athletic. So it's a, it's really, it does make, make him seem a lot bigger than the, the six, eight uh, size. One of the other things I love about watching this game, and I'm sure you'll probably get to this because it jumps off the film when you watch him. He's so good in, in uh, pick and pop situations as far as just rolling off of a screen and getting to getting to the rim for either a lob or an alley oop or, or you know to rebound to your point an offensive uh, an offensive miss. Uh, I think that'll be fun to watch. So again, everybody in the chat, all 217 of you, thanks for being here. Uh, make sure you stay on the lookout for Sean's video breakdown of of what's coming with James Oconquo because I think there's a lot to like and I, and I personally I don't feel like he's just going to be uh, a practice player now I do think there's some legitimate questions about will Hubert Davis use his bench but Sherelle I'm going to come to you do you feel like Oconquo is legitimately a guy who could be a real five uh, and give UNC some minutes when maybe Baycott needs a rest or maybe he's you know he's, if he's dealing with a nagging injury or something or does he just simply take some pressure off of Jalen Withers. I mean, Jalen Withers, uh, Jalen Washington having to be that, that five man. Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, Cause you just don't want Armando Baycott if healthy off the court too much. So it's right. great to have deaf, but let's, let's remember that UNC has a, you know, all American front court player returning for his fifth season and he's going to play and play a lot. I think what this does, I think someone in the chat said it, but you know, his, his ankles have been an issue pretty much each of the last three years. And so if there is a rolled ankle, you know, uh, let's let's take it back to the game. No one wants to talk about if there is a, a Kansas situation where it's a close game or a Duke situation where it's a close game. Maybe um, instead of, you know, uh, Brady Manick at the time or this year, Jalen Washington or Jalen Weathers having to slide down to the five. You have someone who's played, you know, meaningful power five minutes at the five who can come in and give you, you know, 10 to 12 minutes. And I, I, I think that's all you should be looking for, at least this this season. I think what makes this particular um, commitment for UNC significant is that there's still upside for Okwankwo. I mean, <laughs> if part of his story is, so obviously he's from England and he was coming over to the U.S. to play uh, basketball at a high school. Um, I think he was 16 at the time. He came over, he played at the high school for a year, and then the high school had to shutter um, because the uh, founder had some other things going on, not anything nefarious or bad, but just other things going on, the school had to shutter. So they used some of his scores from Britain, uh, reclassed him up two classes, and he ended up at West Virginia as a 17-year-old freshman. So he will be 20 years old when the season starts, but this will be his third year of college basketball. So he's still a relative newcomer to basketball. Um, but he's experienced in college basketball. And so he's got uh, another couple of years remaining, you know, after, well, he's got one more year after this upcoming one remaining. So there's a chance that, you know, he could be an impact player in the future. But I think for now it solidifies, like you said, that role behind Baycott. Um, and then uh, in the future, you know, who knows? He, he could he become, become a starter. He could become uh, someone who can give them even more quality minutes off the bench. I think that's the exciting part if you're a UNC fan is that, <clears throat> there's another player who can provide continuity, who's still developing um, and can do that development at Carolina. And not to and, take anything away from what Hubert Davis and his staff did, but he kind of fell in UNC's lap. Sean, I, I want to let you go here too. You say whatever. <laughs> but, you got, but you have to take it. And, and to your point, Joey, when stuff falls in your lap, you have to take advantage of it. And, and they, they pounce on it as soon as it happens. For sure. Sean, I want to, I want to get to what you were going to say. And I want you to answer this too. How does his, relative inexperience with regard to youth not that he you know not that he only played x amount of minutes per game but that he's only been playing basketball for a small window of time how do you feel like that affects his ceiling all right my my, my service just cut out so oh yeah. I'll, I'll re i'll re-ask um this is, yeah. this is this is live internet TV, folks. Sean, what I was asking you was the the player has only played a small amount of of basketball in his life, you know, just a handful of years. How do you feel like that affects his potential ceiling uh, at UNC? Well, I think oh, kind of goes to what I was about to say after Sherelle is, I mean, whether at UNC or, or West Virginia, these are the kind of guys college hoops are made out of. Like he didn't play at all his freshman year, sophomore. Year playing 12 minutes, not great from past perspective, but pretty good. And I think all right, maybe he's not going to be a, like a up in next season and the type of guy that's going to grow each year. So I think with that, with kind of how new he is, I, I do think there is 
there is upside. And I think also the downside protection now in college hoops is it's, it's easy. It's easier to, you know, kind of trade, trade pieces um, yep. although with one transfer now that that would make it harder. But um, you know, I think it was, it's low, low risk, uh, especially given the scholarship opportunities and maybe not high reward, but there's definitely, there's more upside than, than, than risk on this one. And I think getting to see him, him grow, you mentioned FIBA, what he's going to be playing with, um, which actually starts tomorrow. And those games should be on YouTube. And I'm, I'm going to be fascinated to watch that because he's going to be, I would think maybe not a focal point, but he's going to be a, a much different role in this situation than he is in college. And just to kind of get to see what he can do a little bit more, the competition is not going to be overly impressive, but I think it'll just give uh, everybody a chance to see him a little bit more. But to your point, I, I do think maybe the newness to basketball uh, definitely will play a role in, you know, probably that upward trajectory that he, I think he does have. All right. I'm going to let the, uh, let the chat talk a little bit here and see if they can get us a couple of questions before we get out of here. Sean, I know you've got uh, other duties at home to get to, and Sherelle's got the finest Hampton Inn in uh, North Augusta to, uh, to go out and check out because I'm sure he is, uh, he's dreaming of some NyQuil right now. Um, <laughs> I think one of the obvious questions is, uh, and actually let's start with this one first. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Preston from Greensboro, our guy. Uh, he's asking, when will he be on campus, which I think is a great question. Uh, Sherelle, do you have any ideas what the answer to that might be? I know he's taking the, the visit uh, towards the end of the month on the 24th, but when do you think he will actually matriculate to UNC? Yeah, so <clears throat> the team gets a few weeks off after uh, summer session. They kind of break, and, and they go. everybody goes home. Um, it could be a situation where, because home for him is England, uh, <laughs> maybe he decides to – let me take that back. I think home for him is England. I'm not 100% sure. It could be a situation where he decides to just stay in Chapel Hill and get used to the, his surroundings, go ahead and move into his apartment and all that stuff. But at worst, usually about the week before students come back is when the basketball team typically – um, is on campus. So I would say he, he'll official vi still officially visit July 24th. Um, if he leaves and, and goes wherever home is now, then likely back sometime in, in early to mid-August, probably like the 10th, the week of the 14th, something like that, is usually when they get back. Because <clears throat> summer session two, mm -hmm. uh, he can't enroll in, so he won't be official, an official student until he enrolls in the fall. Okay, that's good information. I think those semantics are, are those are actually more than semantics for for folks that might be paying attention here. Um, I want to I want to get here. I think one of the questions somebody asked, and there's been some duplication of it in, in different iterations, but folks are kind of asking, does this affect how Hubert plays his bench? Because now we're looking at eleven guys who have you know college experience. Uh, this is this went from a team who had four scholarship players, and all of a sudden you've got a rather veteran-laden squad, and even though uh, James O'Connor was younger, as we mentioned earlier, he's played two years in the Big 12. Uh, Sean, I want to go to you first. Do you have any inclinations that that this might um, give Hubert Davis a little more confidence in playing his bench and having these guys in over the summer for a handful of practices and, and scrimmages and all that might actually you know, get the, the head man to, to loosen up the reins a little bit? Yes and no on that one. Yes, it goes to, I think, probably the question we've raised in almost every coast-to-coast -coast chat of how do you distribute minutes, especially when you know there's going to be, at a minimum, two guys that are are kind of part of that Iron Five and RJ and Armando, and then you're bringing in a lot of talented transfers, talented freshmen, et cetera, and none of them are coming here to, to sit the bench. Um, but at the same time, you have two years of – of experience in terms of what has happened. Um, now we, we've talked, maybe that hasn't been his full roster. Maybe that there, there've been other situations, but you have two years that at the end of the day, in the second, when the second half gets going, if you played in the first half and you play well, you're going to get the chance. If not, it's going to be a little harder and the bench is going to get cut short in that second 20 minutes. So I'm still curious to see, you know, one, how the talent shapes out, uh, but two, will there be a little more, flexibility in that second half of playing playing guys versus only playing them when needed or when forced to. Sherelle, I'm going to ask you this. This isn't a question from anybody in the in the chat specifically, but I think there's been some mention of it that, that kind of formulated this question. So shout out to whoever you was talking about him being a practice player. What does having a player like this on UNC's roster, even if he's not first or second option off the bench, 
what does this do for UNC's practices in the post? Because if you remember last year and, and year before, UNC didn't have anybody to go and go against Armando Baycott. Um, and I think when you know when Will Shaver went down, that that made it even worse. What does having a guy like this to go against Baycott and and go against Jalen Washington? What does this do for the team's uh, for the team's ceiling and, and long term prognosis? You're trying to make me say that that phrase, aren't you? You're no, trying to get me. To I, say I have it. no idea what you're talking about. I'm not going to say it. Um, but you know, when you're playing against, <laughs> when you're going up against a great player, it's it's going to make you better. And when you have some resistance, which we think Armando Baycott didn't have a ton of last year, um, is it's natural for things to slip. And that's not that's not you know anything negative towards Armando. It's just reality. Like if you're not facing another six ten or six eleven guy in practice, then you're probably going to get used to not playing against other six ten or six eleven guys who are, who are physical. And now he has that uh, with the phone call. He's got it with Jalen Washington. You know, even Harrison Ingram and Jalen Withers, though they're shorter, they're still kind of bigger, you know, thick guys. They're bigger bodies. And then, yeah, bigger bodies. And then there's, there's Aiden High as well. So there's more bodies in, in the post than there were last year, I think. Um, more serviceable, more experienced. That's the other thing. We're talking about the bench. Um, you know, the first year, Hubert Davis' first year, if you look at it, up until um, – uh, now I'm forgetting names, <laughs> up until Dustin Garcia left the team and up until Anthony Harris left the team, there seemed to have been a, a pretty good seven-slash-eight-man rotation um, mm-hmm. with those guys, the starters, and, and Manning. And then after those two left, it was kind of out of necessity that, you know, they had to play, you know, do the Iron Five thing until Puff got healthy, and then they had, like, five-and-a-half players, you know, basically um, playing in every game. Then last year, it, the bench was pretty much all freshmen, and – I guess in Hubert Davis's estimation that they weren't really ready to play. Um, Styles and Dunn were there, and Dunn was getting some minutes, and Trimble was getting some minutes. But as Sean said, kind of his things tightened, so did the rotation. So I think if you look at um, his first year, when there were experienced guys who had been there before and played some in college basketball, there was somewhat of a bitch. And then when those guys weren't able to play anymore for for various reasons, that went away and it carried over into last season. So I don't think anybody really has an answer because Hubert Davis is the only one who knows how he's going to play his bench. But you would have to think if there was a time to play it, considering the experience that they have this year, considering some of the talent, um, that this is the year to do it. So that's my kind of spill on the bench. As far as the floor with Okwanko, again, it just goes back to, can you come into the game and not be a net negative? And I think that too many times, if you look at the numbers last year, that was happening at various positions. And I think Okwanko has shown that he can come in the game, eight to 10 minutes, get, let Armando breathe, and you know not let the other team go on a nine to two run or 11 to run and, and make Hubert Davis feel like he has to have the starters in at all times. So we'll see, but I think with an experienced bench that maybe he'll play it a little bit more. But Okonkwo helps in, in a variety of ways. Uh, Shrill, if you were talking about like the Iron Five and how maybe a secondary group might make them better, if you're using that in, in terms of, you know, a metallic element, is there a specific phrase you might want to throw out or, or anything that you might kind of uh, gloss to, to, to describe that? No, I'll, I'll nerd out and say like adamantium or vibranium or something. And you'll get upset. <laughs> so I'm not going to say that. Ah, boy, I love that, man. Great stuff. Um Sean, you, you had a note about uh, about James Oconquo's next uh, FIBA game. You want to share that with the group? Yeah, so that, that actually starts tomorrow. So in between people checking out Peach Jam on the, the live stream, 3 p.m. Eastern, his team, Great Britain, plays Austria. So uh, you can you can have the Peach Jam live stream on, on one and uh, the YouTube FIBA on, on the other as the workday wraps up. The, the, you... inter, the intersection of people who are going to have that <laughs> I, I guarantee you they're in this chat right now. Uh, there's there's like in this chat or, uh, one of them might be on the screen at the bottom yeah. of the screen right now. Yeah, there's like 150 people in the world who, who will have those two things <laughs> open at the same time, and they're all in this chat. I will t- I will say to anybody in this chat, if you are watching the Peace Jam stream and you get a, a crowd shot of Sherelle McMillan, please send those to me, joey at insidecarolina.com. I would love to to use this in some way, shape, or form to show some love to our, to our guy here. All right, last question for the night, and we'll get out of here. Um, we've got Jeffrey Polly in the chat who has asked, and this is something we could talk a little bit more about on our regular show Sunday. Um, we're talking about James Oconquo commits to UNC tonight, transfer from West Virginia, 68240. 
Last question, and we'll touch on it briefly. We'll probably dive a little more into it on Sunday. Jeffrey Polly asks, are we done with the roster? So, Sherell, Sean, short answer and maybe one follow-up if you'd like. Uh, is UNC done at this point? Sherell, you're first. I'm going to give you the shrug emoji. But like, let's just see what happens on August 25th when school starts. Because, you know, it's, 20, it's 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So who knows? You know, the thing now is that there are a lot of uh, guys who, once the summer sessions are over at their respective schools, they'll have the credits to graduate. So it could be a situation where there's a whole other market of players come the end of July, early August to enter the portals, graduate transfer. So let's just... I, I, we said Father's Day, but I, I think we're going to have to push it back to Labor Day, maybe. Oh, look at you adjusting everybody's calendar. All right. I'll allow it. Fair enough. Sean, you got any gut feelings? Are you also going to go shrug emoji on me? Gut feeling is is yes, they are, they are done. But I think we've seen never never say never, especially now in, in today's college basketball world. But I think they added a, a very important piece in terms of that bench depth at the big spot. Um so not going to say no, but I, you know, come come back in a, in a month, and I think I, I think we'll be right where we are right now. Well, I think it's uh, I think it's really important that um, that everybody kind of uh, take with a grain of salt what we're saying right now because um, we have some ideas, but also you know things change. We did not anticipate Bob Huggins uh, no longer being the head man at West Virginia, and could not have predicted that this is going to go the way it did. So uh, you know w- what is happening on you know, July the 6th may not be happening on July the 7th. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind whenever we're, we're talking about finality with regard to this roster. Um, one thing we didn't mention about Oconquo is looking at his vitals, uh, six, eight, two forty. we talked about, I'm going to guess he's probably a, a double XL tall from Johnny t-shirt. Um, if, if he's in Nike, I'm guessing double XL tall somewhere around there. Uh, I'm sure he's probably going to make that his first stop when he makes his campus visit on the 24th. And then as he's waiting for, for class to start, he'll probably have plenty of time to, to outfit his wardrobe with uh, with things from, from Johnny T. And we know that he will, just as everybody in the chat tonight and everybody on the message boards will be using their premium uh, discount code found on the message board at johnnytshirt.com to get your extra 10% off. Johnny T-shirt, check him out. Football game in two months, guys. Football game, two months. Um, go ahead and see if you can get... Uh, your football gear ahead of time. They've got new stuff coming in all the time at Johnny T. Check them out right there on East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. My daughter's going to be up there for a uh, soccer camp very soon, so I'll probably stop in and say what's up to the folks. Uh, big fans of theirs. They're big fans of ICs, so it's a it's an awesome relationship and want you guys to take care of them as well. All right, that's going to do it for tonight. Um, shout out to the almost 300 folks that joined us in the, in the chat tonight. We appreciate you being here. I hope you got something out of the show. Um, shout out to Sherelle McMillan for, for tussing it out. Get it? Tussing it out. See what I did there? Um, Shrell's fighting off the uh, the Augusta flu, but we appreciate it. Sean rushed home from work on the West Coast to to get here and be a part of this. So we're uh, we're grateful for you guys being here. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Thank you guys for who participated by asking questions. And until next time, if we don't see you before then, we will see you on Sunday for our regularly scheduled show on Sunday night at 8 o'clock, Coast Coast Podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. But until then, we'll catch you later. Y'all be good.